uh, none of my colleagues have opening remarks. Uh, we have a, an extraordinarily distinguished panel. I'm happy to say I uh, am very grateful to all of you for being here today. Uh, Professor Franita Tolson is Vice Dean for Faculty and Academic Affairs and Professor of Law at the University of Southern California Gould School of Law, where she also holds an appointment in the Political Science and International Relations Department. Her scholarship and teaching focus on the areas of election law, constitutional law, and legal history. She has written on a wide range of topics, including partisan gerrymandering, political parties, the election clause, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the 14th and 15th Amendments. Vice Dean Tolson is one of the co-authors of the Leading Election Law Casebook, the Law of Democracy, published by the Foundation Press. Uh, sixth edition is forthcoming in 2022, I understand. Her forthcoming book, In Congress We Trust, Enforcing Voting Rights from the Founding to the Jim Crow Era, will be published in 2022 by Cambridge University Press. Mr. Hans von Spakowski is Senior Legal Fellow and Manager of the Election Law Reform initiative in the Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Prior to joining the Heritage Foundation, he served as a commissioner of the U United States Federal Election Commission for two years and as a career lawyer in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, including serving as counsel to the Assistant Attorney General from 2002 to 2005. During that time, he helped coordinate the enforcement of federal voting laws and he received three meritorious service awards. Mr. John Yang is president and executive director of Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC. He leads the organization efforts to fight for civil rights and empower Asian Americans to create a more just America for all through public policy, advocacy, education, and litigation. Mr. Yang uses his extensive legal background to enable advancing justice, AAJC, to address systematic policies, programs, and legislative attempts to discriminate against and marginalize Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders and other minority communities. Mr. Yang has held leadership positions in the American Bar Association, the DC Bar Association, and co-founded the Asian American Pacific Legal Resource Center a nonprofit organization dedicated to addressing direct service legal needs of Asian Americans in the DC metropolitan area. Ms. Maureen Riordan is litigation counsel at the Public Interest Legal Foundation. Ms. Riordan previously served at, in the Department of Justice for more than 20 years, including 18 years as Senior Counsel to the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights and Senior Trial Attorney in the Voting Section, and the, uh, as well as her service in, as Assistant Director of the Service Members and Veterans Initiative and as a Special Assistant United States Attorney in the Western District of Virginia. Prior to her tenure at DOJ, Ms. Riordan served as Assistant District Attorney in Nassau County, New York for 15 years. Mr. Thomas Sines is President and General Counsel of MALDEF. He leads the organization in pursuing litigation, policy advocacy, and community education to promote the civil rights of all Latinos living in the United States in the areas of education, employment, Im immigrants' rights, and voting rights. He joined MALDEF in August 2009, after four years on the Los Angeles staff of Mayor Antonio Villagrosa. Uh, he previously spent 12 years at MALDEF practicing civil rights law, including four years in challenges uh, as lead counsel for MALDEF in various cases, including challenges to California Proposition 187, California Proposition 227 and California redistricting. 
In 2006, Mr. Sines argued before the United States Supreme Court in United States versus Texas, representing interveners defending the Obama administration's deferred action initiative. He graduated from Yale College and Yale Law School. He clerked for two federal judges before initially joining Maldef in 1993. I'm going to swear the witnesses, as you know, is our custom, and then ask each of you to present your opening statement. We'll have rounds of questioning, uh, five minutes each. If you would please stand. Do you solemnly affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Dean Tolson, why don't we begin with your testimony, if we may? Thank you. Uh, to Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Cruz, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear and speak about what will hopefully be the Senate version of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act of 2021. It is beyond dispute that voting rights are under assault, and this provision is a necessary step towards restoring the protections of the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court's decision in Shelby County versus Holder hobbled the preclearance regime that would have prevented a number of states from passing new voting restrictions by requiring them to submit these changes to the federal government for approval before they could take effect. Importantly, the Shelby County decision tried to paint pervasive voter discrimination as a relic of a time long past, ignoring that legislators often fall back on certain practices to diminish the political power of minority communities. By singling out certain electoral schemes that disenfranchise and or minimize minority political power, practice-based preclearance updates the provisions that would trigger federal oversight of state electoral systems. From the long eradicated practices like the poll tax and literacy tests heavily criticized by the Shelby County majority, to techniques that have been consistently used and importantly are still being used by states to disenfranchise minority voters. Shelby County notwithstanding, Congress retains substantial authority under the 14th and 15th Amendments, as well as the Elections Clause, to pass practice-based preclearance. The 14th and 15th Amendments protect the fundamental right to vote and prohibit racial discrimination in voting, respectively. While the 15th Amendment empowers Congress to address racially discriminatory action by the states, the 14th Amendment separately authorizes Congress to target practices, either discriminatory or non-discriminatory, that undermine the fundamental right to vote in local, state, or federal elections. However, the Shelby County Court read both amendments to require Congress to establish a pattern of intentionally discriminatory action on the part of the states as a prerequisite for reauthorizing the original coverage formula of Section 4B. This view misrepresents prior case law. Initially, the Supreme Court broadly interpreted Congress's power to enforce the 14th and 15th Amendments. In South Carolina versus Kotzenbach, in City of Rome versus United States, the court rejected the argument that Congress's enforcement power under the 15th Amendment was limited to remedying only intentional racial discrimination and read that provision to be as broad as the necessary and proper clause of Article I. Similar to the 15th Amendment, the court had also described Congress's power under the 14th as broader than the judicial power to defi define the substantive reach of its provisions, but the court uh, substantially narrowed this authority in a case called City of Bernie versus Flores. According to the City of Bernie decision, Congress's enforcement powers are limited to remedial fixes and do not include the ability to make substantive changes to the scope of the 14th Amendment. But there are two important takeaways from the City of Bernie decision as it pertains to Congress's authority to protect the right to vote under the 14th and 15th Amendments. First, Shelby County never determined whether City of Bernie's rationale also applies to the 15th Amendment leaving in place Congress's broad authority to enforce that provision as articulated in City of Rome and Katzenbach. Second, while the court's decision in City of Bernie sharply circumscribed Congress's ability to enforce the 14th Amendment, it remains true after the decision that intentional discrimination is not a necessary prerequisite for a 14th Amendment violation. In Harper versus Virginia State Board of Elections, the court held that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment protects a fundamental right to vote that is distinct from the 15th Amendment's prohibition on racial discrimination in voting. Consequently, Congress is empowered to protect this right through appropriate legislation under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, even in the absence of a pattern of racially discriminatory intent on the part of the states. 
Congress also has broad authority to enact practice-based preclearance through the Elections Clause, which empowers states to choose the time, places, and manner of federal elections, but importantly, reserves to Congress the power to make or alter state electoral schemes. The court, in assessing the constitutionality of the coverage formula of Section 4B, ignored how the Elections Clause, as a potential source of congressional authority for the Voting Rights Act, mitigated the federalism concerns raised by the statute. Under the clause, Congress has authority to alter state law where appropriate, make law completely independent of the state's legal regime, and commandeer state officials to implement federal law. This structure permits Congress to enact a complete code for federal elections, which is an invaluable source of authority, particularly if states have jeopardized the health and vitality of federal elections in some way. Indeed, the practice-based preclearance provision isolates those practices that states have historically used to abridge or deny the right to vote and it does so without singling out any particular geographic area or jurisdiction. Congress's power under the 14th and 15th Amendments and the Elections Clause provides sufficient authorization for practice-based preclearance because those provisions empower Congress to enact legislation seeking to prevent local, state, and federal election regulations that abridge or deny the right to vote. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dean Tolson. We're gonna to turn to Mr. Spakovsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> There's no need for legislative reforms to the Voting Rights Act, which is one of the most successful laws ever passed by Congress. After the Supreme Court's correct decision in Shelby, the Voting Rights Act, including Section 2, remains a powerful statute that is more than sufficient to protect all Americans. With the latest guidance from the court on the proper application of Section 2 and the Bronovich decision, the Justice Department and private parties have the legal means to stop those increasingly rare instances of voting discrimination when they occur. The claim that there is a wave of voter suppression going on that requires expansion of the Voting Rights Act is simply false. Enhancing the integrity of the election process through reforms such as voter ID requirements and improvements in the accuracy of voter registration lists protects voters and is not voter suppression. A 2019 survey of 10 years of turnout data from all 50 states found that voter ID laws, quote, have no negative effect on registration or turnout overall or for any group defined by race, gender, age, or party affiliation. Voter ID laws are in place in numerous states like Indiana, Georgia, Alabama, Tennessee, South Carolina, Wisconsin, Kansas, Arkansas, Mississippi, and Texas because courts agree they are not discriminatory. There have been steady increases in registration and turnout in states that have implemented such reforms. The Justice Department has seen a steady decrease in enforcement actions due to a decreasing number of violations of federal law. During the entire eight years of the Obama administration, DOJ filed only four cases to enforce Section 2. The Trump administration filed two Section 2 cases so the Frequency of the cases was exactly the same. Thus, there was no upsurge in Section 2 cases after the Shelby County decision. In fact, the Obama administration filed far fewer Section 2 enforcement actions than the Bush administration. That record does not support the claim that there are widespread, unlawful voter suppression actions being taken against minority voters. The Census Bureau's 2020 election survey also clearly demonstrates there's no wave of voter suppression keeping Americans from registering and voting that requires amending and expanding the VRA. Indeed, the Census Bureau reports that the turnout in last year's election was 66.8%, just short of the record turnout of 67.7% of voting age citizens in the 1992 election. This was higher turnout than in President Barack Obama's first election. The census survey shows that there was higher turnout among all races in 2020 when compared to the 2016 election. In fact, in an election year in which we were dealing with an unprecedented shutdown of the country due to a pandemic, we had, according to the Census Bureau, the highest voter turnout of the 21st century. The proposed amendments are almost certainly unconstitutional because they do not satisfy what is required by the Supreme Court's decision to justify continuing, much less expanding, the preclearance requirement. Any requirement that states obtain pre-approval of voting changes can only be imposed if Congress can show blatantly discriminatory evasions of federal court decrees, lack of minority office holding, 
voting tests and devices, voting discrimination on a pervasive scale, and flagrant or rampant voting discrimination. None of those conditions are anywhere to be found in any state in 2021. The new coverage formula is also unfair and violates basic due process principles and will not satisfy constitutional concerns since it will impose coverage even on jurisdictions that have never engaged in any discriminatory conduct because of problems caused by other jurisdictions within a state. The unprecedented practice-based preclearance provision also violates basic due process. It is so broad and covers such a wide spectrum of election procedures that virtually all changes made by state and local governments could be vetoed. The provisions also in the bill intended to overturn the Baranovich decision are ill-advised and interfere with the state's constitutional authority over the administration of election. They attempt to get rid of factors that are very relevant to determining whether a Section 2 violation has occurred. With the availability of Section 3 of the Voting Rights Act, which allows a court to impose pre-clearance -pre requirements on a specific jurisdiction, that is much better than a broad-based coverage. It is not 1965, and there's no longer any justification for giving the federal government the ability to veto the election laws chosen by voters and their elected representatives. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yang? Good morning. Thank you. Thank you to Cher Chairman Blumenthal, Ranking Member Cruz, and the other members of this subcommittee and committee. Practice-based preclearance, in conjunction with the restored coverage formula, is critical to modernizing the Voting Rights Act to reflect the emerging political voice of Asian American voters. In targeting those practices that have been used throughout history to silence the political voice of minority communities just when they begin to reach critical mass and when they could begin to impact the outcome of elections, Practice-based preclearance will ensure that these practices are reviewed in areas where Asian Americans and other communities of color are reaching the point where they are perceived as threats to ensure that the practice being proposed is not discriminatory or harmful to minority communities. These issues have a special relevance to the Asian American community. According to the 2020 census, Asian Americans are the nation's fastest growing ethnic group with a growth rate of 35% between 2010 and 2020 growing to over 24 million Asian Americans and making up over 7% of the total population. Our community has more than doubled in the last 20 years. For our community, this issue is not a partisan one. It is about having a voice in democracy. While the Asian American population has ex increased exponentially in the last 50 years, our community also has been part of the American fabric for centuries, whether as railroad workers for the Transcontinental Railroad, as Japanese American soldiers in the most decorated World War II combat regiment, Senator Inouye's 442nd. Nevertheless, Asian Americans are still perceived as outsiders, aliens, perpetual foreigners. Indeed, we have seen an exponential rise in anti-Asian hate in the last 21 months because of the scapegoating of Asian Americans as foreign, disease-carrying, and somehow a threat to America. Because of these rapidly changing demographics, a fully restored Voting Rights Act must include both a substitute coverage formula for jurisdictions based on a history of voting discrimination and a mechanism that addresses the needs of emerging communities of color that face discrimination aimed to silence their political influence by those currently in power. In this manner, a history-based coverage formula alone is not enough to protect the voting rights of emerging minority populations. The reality is that more and more of the most rapidly growing racial ethnic language minority communities are found in cities and states where there were not significant numbers previously. Stated differently, those jurisdictions where minorities grow, have grown rapidly in size only recently often are unlikely to have a history of voter suppression because such tactics were previously unnecessary. Yet history has borne out that the pockets of the most determined efforts to restrict minority voting rights were in areas of the country where racial ethnic groups made up a larger than average share of the population because that is when they will be more likely to have a substantial influence on election outcomes. An assessment by Professor Luis Fraga in testimony before the House Judiciary Committee shows that the U.S. has a long history of restricting the vote to specific segments of the population across the nation, which were often identified as a group based on race, ethnicity, national origin, or gender. Racial tensions often occur when groups of minorities grow rapidly in an area and when there is an increase in political relevance of that minority community, such as Asian American communities across the country. This can lead to fear and resentment toward Asian Americans by those in power, 
which can then result in hampering Asian Americans in exercising their freedom to, and right to vote without harassment and discrimination. Discriminatory attitudes toward Asian Americans and the perpetual foreign image unfortunately have been squarely embedded in the political process. Insidious manifestations of the stereotype can be found in the negative political ads and the manipulation of images of minority candidates in an attempt to trigger negative stereotypes. For example, a state legislator in 2009 suggested that Asian American voters adopt na names that are easier for Americans to deal with to avoid difficulties imposed on them by voter identification laws. This statement suggests, among other things, that Asian Americans are somehow apart from other Americans. Similarly, in a 2004 primary election, supporters of a white, candidate, a white incumbent facing a Vietnamese American opponent challenged the eligibility of only Asian Americans at the polls. The losing incumbent's rationale was, if they couldn't speak good English, they possibly weren't American citizens. These two examples just provide just a snapshot of the types of discriminatory practices historically used to silence the voice of minority voters. In conclusion, by including a preclearance mechanism based on practices, we are complementing the jurisdictional coverage formula to provide an efficient manner for addressing jurisdictions where minority populations are growing in previously non-majority jurisdictions. By doing so, we will be safeguarding the political voice of all citizens. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Yang. Uh, Ms. Riordan. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cruz, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your invitation to testify before you today. I am currently a litigation associate with the Public Interest Legal Foundation, which is a nonpartisan charity that devotes itself to promoting election integrity and preserving the constitutional mandate that allows states to administer their own elections. I've been an attorney for approximately 35 years, 20 of those years I served in the Civil Rights Division at the department as both the voting section attorney and as senior counsel to the associate to the AG for civil rights. From 2000 when I began at the department until 2013 when the Shelby County versus Holder decision uh, was, was made by the Supreme Court, my primary responsibility was to review changes in voting that were submitted for preclearance. If passed, H.R. 4 will give tremendous power over the election procedures of every state and local election to the partisan bureaucrats in the voting section. I watched this power abused firsthand, and I would like to share with you a few of the experiences I had while working there. I began my employment in 2000, right prior to the 2000 election. And when the Florida recount occurred, I personally observed attorneys within the section strategizing, faxing, and receiving faxes from DNC operatives in Florida. Such partisan beliefs permeate every aspect of the section's work. I also witnessed twisted racialism when George Bush appointed Ralph Boyd, an African American, to head the Civil Rights Division I often heard from attorneys that, well, he's not really black, and that no self-respecting black man would be a Republican. These statements were accepted beliefs by most attorneys in the section. I would urge everybody here to read the DOJ Inspector General report on the voting section. It provides instance after instance of bad behavior, often racially motivated. It includes abuse of an African-American paralegal that was deemed by other attorneys in the section not to be black enough. The voting section has a long record of abuse by its lawyers for improper collaboration with other advocacy groups. Between 1993 and 2000, the voting section has been sanctioned $2,358,000. For example, in Johnson versus Miller, the United States District Court sanctioned the voting section almost $600,000 for collusive misconduct by DOJ attorneys with attorneys from the ACLU. The federal court pronounced the collusion between the DOJ and the ACLU as disturbing. And when an attorney, when questioned by the court, could not remember the exact circumstances of the relationship, the judge found that her professed amnesia was less than credible. That continues today. On more than one occasion, after receiving a submission for a review, I was instructed to strategize with these very same advocacy groups. Furthermore, there is an open hostility to conservative states and elected officials. I have observed signs on doors that say, mess with Texas, and the targeting, I've seen the targeting of specific elected officials when they review state redistricting maps for preclearance. Abuse of power in the Section 5 process is not confined to Johnson versus Miller, and my written testimony provides additional instances. 
Section 5 was a temporary provision is for a reason that no longer exists. The Supreme Court made clear in Shelby that today only certain conditions would justify any formula for Section 5 coverage, including blatantly discriminatory evasions of federal decrees, voting discrimination on a pervasive and rampant scale, and lack of minority office holders. I would ask senators who support this bill to cite one single instance of an invasion of a federal decree in a voting rights case, just one. As the Supreme Court stated, federal intrusion into the powers reserved by the Constitution to the states must really relate to empirical and present circumstances. <clears throat> According to information received from DOJ through a FOIA request by our organization, from 2000 to 2013, while I was at the voting section, we reviewed 222,132 submissions, but issued only 81 objections. An objection does not require any evidence of intentional discrimination. That is only 0.036 of 1% of all the submissions reviewed. The proposed changes to Section 2 that are included in H.R. 4 turn Supreme Court precedent on its head. Once Americans begin to suspect that the Voting Rights Act is no longer being used to protect racial minorities but political parties, they will stop supporting it. America, once Americans think that Section 2, which has been an incredibly successful civil rights statute, is a partisan tool, you will see support for civil rights evaporate. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Ms. Riordan. And now, Mr. Sign. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, honorable senators. For the last 12 years, I've had the great honor of leading the Mexican-American Legal Defense and Educational Fund, a now 53-year-old national legal civil rights organization whose mission is to promote the civil rights of all Latinos living in the United States. Throughout those 50 year, 53 years, we have engaged in much litigation under Section 2, Section 5, and Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, as well as under the 14th and 15th Amendment with respect to voting in this country. In addition to leading MALDA, for the last seven years, I have been the lead administrator of a, an informal consortium of 12 of the leading nonprofit voting rights litigating organizations in this country. Based on that experience, I can assure you, without any doubt, that the 2013 decision in Shelby County versus Holder dealt a severe blow to civil and voting rights in this country. It did so by effectively dismantling Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, a provision accurately characterized by many as the most effective piece of civil rights legislation in our nation's history. And that provision, which blocked, as you've indicated, Mr. Chair, a number of voting rights violations from ever taking effect, over the years prevented and deterred numerous violations of voting rights. It did so in an efficient and effective manner by employing an alternative dispute resolution or ADR mechanism. That's right, in addition to being an effective civil rights law, Section 5 was also perhaps the first enactment by this Congress of an ADR program for resolving disputes, these relating to voting rights. Like all good ADR, preclearance is efficient and effective preventing waste of time and cost in litigation that would otherwise occur under Section 2 and other provisions of the Voting Rights Act. The ADR that was effectively disabled in the Shelby County decision took the form of requiring covered jurisdictions to submit for pre-review voting-related changes to the Department of Justice or at the option of the jurisdiction, an option that at MALDEF we have seen the state of Texas invoke on numerous occasions to the U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. for a pre-review and approval of those changes. Dismantling preclearance, as accomplished by the Shelby County decision, must be reversed for us to have a hope of preserving voting rights in the future in this country. As I have mentioned, litigation under Section 2 that MALDEF and the other groups we work with in that consortium have consistently engaged in is expensive and time consuming. It is so because under the law, Section 2 applies a totality of the circumstances test in court 
to alleged violations of voting rights. As totality of the circumstances suggests, these cases involve multiple expert and lay witnesses, thousands of pages of documents before they reach resolution. That means that we need an alternative in order to ensure that voting rights violations are not widespread across this country. That alternative is the ADR in preclearance. Litigating under Section 2 is simply not possible as a sole mechanism to prevent voting rights violations. The legislation considered and passed by the House included practice-based coverage as an element of a new preclearance formula. Practice-based coverage focuses specifically on practices that have a long history, demonstrated history, of being used to violate the rights of minority voters. Generally speaking, this has occurred where a jurisdiction sees a group of minority voters reaching a tipping point, critical mass to be, be perceived as a threat to those currently in power. That's when they invoke these voting rights violations, vote suppression mechanisms. But preclearance through the practice-based coverage formula would use the efficient mechanism of pre-review by the Department of Justice or a U.S. District Court in Washington, D.C. to ensure that these mechanisms could not be used again to violate the rights of growing minority voting groups. Representing the Latino community, I recognize, as the census confirmed last month, that the Latino community as a fast-growing community, accounting for over 51% of the growth of the entire country over the last decade, will face challenges by those who perceive growing Latino voting communities as a threat and will need to respond effectively. Practice-based coverage is an essential element of that effective response. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sines. I'm going to turn first for questions to my colleague, Senator Leahy. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I do appreciate that. Uh, you know, as I hear some of the questions being asked, I hear some of the discussions, I thought probably I'd just put a couple facts in here. I'm the lead Senate sponsor of the VA, VRA. I'm <coughs> in talks trying to get... Uh, brought in bipartisan support for it, as there always has been in the past. In fact, uh, restoring the Voting Rights Act has been an, an overwhelmingly bipartisan effort for virtually the entire history. The landmark law, whether in President Nixon, uh, President Reagan, President Bush, and others. One of the concerns I hear from my Republican friends is that certain preclearance enforcement programs unfairly target some states over others. But I understand the practice-based preclearance applies to every state and every jurisdiction equally. I call it an equal opportunity enforcement power. So Professor Tolson, could you comment on how practice-based preclearance treats all states and jurisdictions as equals, and shouldn't that help to uh, allay concerns about certain states being treated differently? Thank you, Senator. <coughs> um, so practice-based preclearance is a direct response to the concerns raised by the court in Shelby County versus Holder about having coverage based on outdated practices like the poll tax or literacy tests. Um, and, and also using those practice, practices to target specific jurisdictions. Practice-based preclearance doesn't target any geographic areas. Instead, it focuses on practices that courts have consistently found to be used against minorities at a point where they are starting to influence the outcome of elections. And so in that way, practice-based preclearance is directly responsive to Shelby County and applies to all jurisdictions equally. Well, one of the reasons I asked that, uh some try to say that preclearance is tended to protect uh, just Democratic voters, not other voters. You know, I, I look at uh, preclearance powers that could stop sudden changes to, well, absentee voting. And rural and elderly voters who consistently tend to vote Republican rely heavily on absentee voting. So. Mr. Yang, uh, 
doesn't uh, preclearance powers have to protect the voting rights of all Americans and not just one group or another? Thank you for that question, Senator Leahy. Absolutely. The program should protect all Americans and not specific categories. And that's, again, the benefit of practice-based preclearance because we're focusing on specific practices, number one, and number two, using demographics as a trigger. We are not using, uh, we are not using necessarily a lo long history with respect to the recognition that demographics are changing. They ch oftentimes change rapidly, and the needs could change rapidly. As I testified earlier with respect to the Asian American community, our community is emerging in many places where people would not think of, whether it is in Arkansas with respect to the Pacific Islander community, whether it is in Nevada with respect to the Filipino and Chinese American community. And so having a practice-based preclearance that is triggered by a practice that is historically known to discriminate and uh, with res respect to demographics where an emerging minority community exists, that really it ensures that we have equal protection of all different categories. Well, I, you know, I, I like dealing in facts. I, I know the former uh, president, Mr. Trump, spoke heavily about uh, voter fraud and saying that's why he lost by several million votes. Uh, there was a significant example of voter fraud in Pennsylvania. They investigated that and found that there was a man who voted on behalf of his dead mother for Donald Trump. Um, but it didn't affect the, the outcome. Now, Professor Tolson, what do we remember about the uh, VRA's history? You, you studied that as much as anybody I know. And I think about the fact that it brought Republicans and Democrats together across the political spectrum to support it in the past. Me is that um, the Voting Rights Act is not designed to protect voters of one party or another, right? It's something that has been consistently, at least prior to 2013, been in place through Republican and Democratic administrations. Um, but in, in recent years, particularly post Shelby County, we've seen efforts to um, try to uh, diminish the political power of minorities uh, in a post Shelby world. So it's not partisan legislation, and believe it or not, um, I'm a voting rights expert, and I don't care who people vote for. I just want people to vote. And so um, the modernizing the Voting Rights Act really is important. Um, and can I make one other point, Senator? Um, sure. 30 seconds left. Uh, this, this notion of uh, widespread voter fraud is not something that uh, is really a thing. And I think it's important to emphasize that, because what we're seeing is states start to legislate uh, to try to stop something that doesn't exist um, and sort of the, the, to match the rhetoric. So as you pointed out, there are instances of fraud, but we cannot build a regulatory regime in order to stop a problem that is not extensive. We really do have to step in to protect minority voting rights. That has to be our focus. And so I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Senator Blumenthal. Thanks very much, Senator Leahy. Uh, I, I'm going to forego my questions and turn to the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to start with a question for each of the five witnesses. Uh, in your judgment, are voter ID laws racist? Professor Tolson. Thank you for that question. Um, so it depends. One thing we have to stop doing is treating all voter ID laws as the same. Okay, so your answer, I, I, I want to move quickly, so it depends is your answer? Yes, it, that's my answer. Okay, so what voter ID laws are racist? Apologies, Mr. Cruz, your state of Texas, perhaps? Okay, so you think the entire state of Texas is racist. What about requiring an ID to vote is racist? Um, so I think, sir, that's a pretty reductive. I'm not saying the entire state of Texas is racist. You just but said my state of Texas, so you tell me. Your what about I the Texas oh, voter absolutely. ID laws is racist? So the fact that the voter ID law was put into place to diminish the political power of Latinos uh, with racist intent and it had been found to if have You're asserting that. Intent, what's your evidence for that? Uh, the, district, the federal district court that first resolve the constitutionality of Texas's voter ID law. Okay, so your view is voter ID laws are racist. How about you, Mr. Yang? I agree with Professor Tulsa. Voter ID laws can be racist. Okay, that's two. Mr. Science? There are some voter ID laws that are racially discriminatory in intent. How about in, in practice? In intent, I, fine, you, you say there's some racist with, with a malevolent but, intent lurking in the back of their mind. But let's just talk about it as a practical matter. When I go to vote, they ask me for my ID. I pull out my ID, I show it to them, I vote. Is that racist? If the law that requires you to do that 
was motivated by racially discriminatory intent what, what about the under effect? our set, Constitution. Set aside, set aside intent. Set aside intent. I'm that, asking about the effect. Yes, in effect, okay. I think that Ms. there are Reardon. discriminatory effects from a number of voter ID laws. Okay, thank I'm you, Mr. Reardon. I'm going to give the witness a chance to answer the question. Go ahead, Mr. Sign. Yes, in effect, I think many voter ID laws are discriminatory okay. and in design. They are designed to have that effect. Okay, Ms. Reardon. No, sir. Mr. Van uh, uh, Spakovsky. Uh, no, particularly because every single state that has passed an ID law has put in a provision to provide a free ID to anyone who doesn't have one. The turnout numbers show it has no effect. And I would remind everyone that the current version of the Texas voter ID law for in-person voting, the Obama administration agreed in court in a court filing that they were satisfied with it and that it was not discriminatory. You know, I have to say this range of question actually shows the wildly partisan nature of the Democrats' proposal. The record should reflect all three of the Democratic witnesses invited by the chairman maintained to this committee that voter ID laws can be, in many instances, in most instances, I think of the various ways they formulated, are racist. So let me tell you who disagrees with that. 35 states across the country disagree with that because 35 states have voter ID laws in effect. But not just 35 states. 81% of voters in America disagree with the radical views proposed by the Democrats and the Democratic witnesses. Not just 81% of Americans. 77% of black voters in America support voter ID laws. 78% of Hispanic voters in America support voter ID laws. Maldives should think about that. 81% of low-income Americans support voter ID laws. And yet, what this bill is about is putting radicals in charge of saying, if you require an ID to vote, that is racist and must be struck down. This is all about partisan power. Now, DOJ has also said, under the Biden administration, that it is not going to presume that, state acts that, uh, that a state acts lawfully if it simply returns to pre-COVID voting laws. Ms. Reardon, Mr. Van, Van Spakovsky, what does that tell you if they say after a pandemic, if you go back to the laws that existed before, DOJ is not gonna assume that that's okay. Well, what does that tell you about the partisan nature of DOJ? By, um, by, the, by issuing the guidance that they did, it says to me that what they would like to do is make permanent the um, emergency procedures that were um, instituted by uh, many states through litigation by the DNC throughout the, throughout the country prior to the 2020 election. And they would like those to be permanent. And so rather than understand that they are temporary, they are going to go after states that designed to go back to their original election procedures. Well, and I think they also think Democrats did well under those emergency procedures, and so putting those, keeping those emergency procedures in place will predictably benefit Democrats. You know, I would note, in addition to disagreeing with the vast majority of the American people, the Democratic witnesses and the Democrats here also agree with, disagree with the United States Supreme Court. When I was the Solicitor General of Texas, I represented a coalition of states defending Indiana's voter ID law uh, before the U.S. Supreme Court, a group of plaintiffs challenged that. It went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court, by a vote of six to three, upheld Indiana's voter ID law. Not only did they dis do so, Justice John Paul Stevens, one of the lions of the left, wrote the majority opinion where he said voter ID laws protect the integrity of elections. And yet, sadly, too many Democrats today don't want to protect the integrity of elections. And I've got to say there is a view, particularly from Northeastern Democrats, that they look down on the rest of the country as a bunch of bigots and overalls, their southern cousins who are too oafish to be as enlightened as they are. And I have to say there's an incredible hypocrisy in that, in that states like Georgia and Mississippi have a higher black voter registration rate than states like Connecticut, the chairman's home state. They have higher black voter turnout rates than states like Connecticut. They have a lower gap between black and white turnout than in states like Senator Blumenthal's Connecticut. And in fact, states like Georgia and Mississippi 
African Americans vote at a higher rate than white voters, and in Texas, they're basically e equal. One of the sad realities of today's Democratic Party is they define race as follows. If you're a Democrat, you qualify. So under the Democratic view, I'm not Hispanic. Senator Padilla is. If you're a Democrat, you're an Hispanic. My, my abuelo and abuela would be very surprised to discover I wasn't Hispanic. But that's how Democrat views it. That's how the radicals in the civil rights division view it. And I will point out as an example, this committee, one new federal district judge in the state of Texas, Jason Pulliam, is an African-American judge nominated by President Trump, sat at this table, presented superbly. The Democrats had no criticism, and every single Democrat on this committee voted against him. Why? Because they perceived him as a black Republican. He didn't qualify as a black man. And I actually asked, as the Democrats were voting against Judge Pulliam, do you have one basis to vote against him? Anything you disagree with, none of them had any single answer at all. This hearing's about one thing. It's about power, and it's about ensuring Democrats stay in power. That's cynical, and it's at the expense of democracy and the right of voters to express their will through free and fair elections. Uh, I'm going to ask my questions now and just begin by saying this hearing has nothing to do with any geographic discrimination, any idea that one state or another is oafish. I think that is laughable and sad, almost pathetic. And I say sad because in his opinion for the court, Chief Justice Roberts said, our country has changed. He said, history did not end in 1965. Our country has changed. And one way our country has changed in very dramatic and deeply harmful effect is in what you've just heard. What you've just heard is a partisan diatribe with very little connection to facts. But put aside the tenuous connection to reality, what's most disturbing is the partisan nature of that attack because the Voting Rights Act used to be bipartisan. It was reauthorized again and again and again with overwhelming bipartisan support because it protected the right to vote, which is a deeply American value. It's not Republican, it's not Democrat, it's not Southern, it's not Northeast. I'm proud of the fact that the Connecticut legislature has approved an amendment to the state constitution to allow for early in-person voting, which will be on the ballot in 2022. I'm proud that in June, Connecticut became the latest state to restore voting rights for people with felony convictions. I'm proud that the Connecticut House recently expanded the franchise by expanding access to absentee ballots with a bipartisan majority. Connecticut is moving in the right direction, but it has nothing to do with Democrat or Republican because there was support among Republicans and Democrats for those changes in the law. And in my opening statement, I said nothing about Republicans. It was solely about the right to vote and about expanding and protecting the franchise against efforts to contract it. So far from disapproving or disparaging any state based on any characteristics, in fact, I laud and admire the efforts of, for example, members of the legislature in southern states like Florida, Georgia, Texas, to resist laws suppressing the right to vote. The fact of the matter is, as my colleague from Georgia said, Raphael Warnock, some people just don't want some people to vote. That's what we have here. And it should never be partisan when we talk about the right to vote. So let me ask uh, Mr. Sines, uh, is stripping the 
vote from hundreds of thousands of people, as would be done by, for example, the law of Texas, what democracy is all about to you? Not at all. And let me begin, though, by saying, Senator, that I'm from California, born and raised. You did indicate in my biography I had the privilege of going to school, college and law school in Connecticut. I do not consider myself a Northeasterner. My mother was born in Arizona. My father's family is from New Mexico. The organization that I had was founded in San Antonio, Texas. We still have a thriving office in that state. And no, what you've just described as would occur under the recently enacted law, disenfranchising hundreds of thousands of voters is not democracy. And ensuring that we have mechanisms in place to swiftly respond before any election moves forward under such a regime is critical to ensuring that voting rights are protected in the future in this country. We have filed at Maldiff a lawsuit against that Texas law. It is be just beginning. Because it is under the Voting Rights Act, it will take a long time to resolve. We cannot allow the length of time that these cases take to prevent our protection in the immediate forthcoming elections of those voters. That's why we need the ADR in preclearance. A number of you have been asked about uh, voter ID laws. My interpretation of your testimony is that mm. you would approve or disapprove voter ID laws and think they pass muster under the Constitution depending on the law, depending on its provisions, depending on its intent and its effect. Because as we know, most of us in this room are lawyers, that's how you judge laws. You read them, and then you judge them on their effect and <clears throat> impact and on their intent. Is that a correct interpretation of your testimony, Assistant Dean Tolson? Yes, voter ID laws vary. Texas, in particular, has one of the most restrictive voter ID laws in the country, and they didn't spend a decade litigating it because of concerns about fraud. The statements made in the Texas legislature indicated that it was to suppress the turnout among Latinos. Um, and it was also very different from the voter ID law litigated in Crawford, which was a facial challenge and it hadn't went into effect yet. And on its face was not as restrictive as <clears throat> Texas's law. Mr. Yang. Absolutely. For example, in my testimony, I talked about the fact that one state legislator su essentially suggested that Asian Americans should change their names so that they could comply with voter ID laws or make it simpler to comply with the voter ID laws. We have numerous examples of where you have exact match provisions where because of the way Asian names have been misspelled historically, have been found to be ineligible to vote or have be forced to cast a provisional ballot and search for the right documentation, documentation that frankly oftentimes costs money. I, I understand that Free IDs can be offered, but those free IDs, in order to get them, oftentimes requires birth certificates or other documentation that requires money to get. Mr. Zayn. Yes, Senator, of course. What the Department of Justice would do in evaluating any voter ID provision is apply a well-established standard of intent or retrogression. And if it satisfied that standard, it would be approved. And I hasten to note that any jurisdiction that doesn't trust the Department of Justice as the state of Texas did prior to Shelby County with its own voter ID law, can choose to bypass the Department of Justice and go to a three-judge district court here in Washington, D.C., where those judges will apply the exact same well-established standards to carefully evaluate the specifics of that law. Thank you. I should make the point, by the way, that I would support certain voter ID laws depending on how they are framed, written, what they're impact and effect are and what their intent is going through that kind of analysis. Senator Corner. Actually, if I can briefly, Mr. Chairman, you said in your remarks that, that, that my, my questions were a partisan diatribe. And, and I do want to briefly point out, I just want to quote from the United States Supreme Court, Justice Stevens' opinion for the majority for six justices, where he described laws preventing voter fraud as, quote, protecting public confidence in the integrity of the electoral process, which has independent significance because it encourages citizen participation in the democratic process. As the Carter Baker report observed, and here the court quotes from Democratic President Jimmy Carter and Republican Secretary of State James Baker, quote, the electoral system cannot inspire public confidence 
if no safeguard exists to determine, to deter or detect fraud or to confirm the identity of voters. So apparently the views of President Jimmy Carter, the views of a six justice majority of the Supreme Court are, are deemed by some members of this, this committee to be simp simply a partisan diatribe. And, and, and if that's the case, I, I would ask the chairman, you, you, you talked about the laws in Connecticut, why is it that Connecticut has lower African-American registration and lower African-American turnout than Georgia and Mississippi? You know, uh, I'm really not here to debate you, Mr. Cruz. I subscribe to Justice Stevens' opinion and to the <clears throat> views of former President Carter, a distinguished Southerner, and I'm gonna to turn to another distinguished Southerner, Senator Cornyn. That speaks volumes. I, uh, I wanna start by congratulating uh, you, Mr. Chairman, and the state of Connecticut for joining 44 other states that allow early in-person voting, including Texas. Um, I think that's important. Texas now, I think, provides up to 17 days of early voting. Anybody who's qualified to vote can vote in Texas. And let me agree with you, Mr. Spakovsky. Um, I believe the Voting Rights Act has been one of the most important civil rights laws ever passed in this country's history. And um, the great thing is it has actually worked. It changed behavior in the states that were covered by the original formula uh, dating back to 1965. And it was the failure of Congress, which was intentional, to not update that formula to reflect current conditions, which the Supreme Court held unconstitutional under se Section 4 of the Voting Rights Act, correct? That's exactly correct. And the pre-clearance requirement, Section 5, is still on the books. The Supreme Court didn't hold Section 5 unconstitutional, did it? Uh, no, only the coverage formula because it was so out of date. And I don't know if you've looked at H.R. 4 or not, uh, I'm, well, I'll take that back. I'm sure you have. But the coverage formula, which has been touted by some of the witnesses here, uh, would reach back 25 years and thus not reflect current conditions, which is what the Supreme Court held would be the standard for the extraordinary measure of the federal government um, having the ability to pre-clear uh, voting law changes. Would that suffer, in your opinion, from the same um, problem that uh, Shelby County did, or a similar problem in that it did not does not just cover current conditions? Yeah, no, I think that is that is a problem. And furthermore, the, the other pro big problem with the formula is uh, if you have one particular town or city government in an entire state, and it's a problem, it, it engages in discrimination. It does so repeatedly. If it does it enough times, the entire state will become covered, even though all of the other local governments had absolutely nothing to do whatsoever with what that one county was doing, had no control over what they were doing, which shows that this blanket coverage, I think, is, it has severe problems under the Constitution. Would you go so far as to say that H.R. 4, if passed by Congress and signed into law by President Biden would be unconstitutional? Yeah, I don't think it fits any of the conditions the Supreme Court has lined out. It's important for people to, under, to remember that when the Supreme Court in the uh, early 1960s, in a very important case, upheld Section 5, they pointed out that it was an extraordinary intrusion into state sovereignty that was justified at the time because of the widespread discrimination going on in places like Mississippi. That widespread discrimination today has totally disappeared. There, there's no difference between states like uh, Mississippi that was covered and other states that weren't, except in many instances, Mississippi actually has better turnout and better registration than the non-covered states. Members of the United States Congress take an oath to uphold the Constitution and laws of the United States. I'm tempted to ask you, but I won't, what do you think a vote for H.R. 4, which you believe is unconstitutional, would, com would uh, be consistent with a member of Congress's oath to uphold 
the Constitution and laws of the United States. I personally see tremendous conflict there, and I don't know how a senator or congressman could vote for a law which so clearly would be held unconstitutional under the Shelby County precedent, uh, but that is their decision to make. I would just point out, as many have, Senator Cruz and others, that the turnout in places like Mississippi, uh, Georgia, um, uh, Texas, and the like of minority populations far exceeds the chairman's state of Connecticut, where 49.6% um, of African Americans were registered to vote and only 39% have voted. To me, I think the focus is perhaps in the wrong place. But Ms. didn't let me just ask you, uh, you've, you've documented how in your uh, testimony and in your uh, sworn testimony you gave us uh, that's in writing, that's part of this record, how unelected officials at the Department of Justice basically had previously been given veto power over the elected representatives of the people in the states uh, to decide whether to pre-clear uh, these voting law changes or not. I, I just, Constitution aside, it gives me pause when somehow unelected lawyers at the Department of Justice get to determine what elected officials can do in the various states consistent with principles of federalism. But is there any doubt in your mind that the uh, pre-clearance requirement, if reinstated, could and probably would be used for partisan political purposes? Based upon my 20 years of experience within that section, I have no doubt that it will be used in a partisan fashion. Thank you. Senator Whitehead. Thank you, Chairman Blumenthal. I want to um, offer a little background to the battle that we're having over the um, national effort by the Republican Party to suppress and diminish Democratic and minority voting. Um, and that is some of the peculiar behavior that is around it. We have seen, for instance, the Heritage Action video, um, a donor video in which the Heritage Action fundraiser was telling the donors behind the effort um, how successful the effort had been to get voter suppression language adopted by Republican state legislatures. Uh, they didn't even know it was us, uh, she said. Uh, we worked through, quote, sentinels to uh, get our bills passed in these states. Um, clearly, there is dark money mischief afoot uh, behind all of this. And I want to flag a group that I've looked at pretty steadily, which is a group called the Judicial Crisis Network. It pairs with Judicial Education Project. When people get up to po politics in 501c, 501c land, they usually pair a 501c3 and a 501c4 and work through that pair. Judicial Crisis Network was the group that spent the money against Garland when he was Obama's nominee, and then for Gorsuch, for Kavanaugh, for Barrett, the scheme to capture the Supreme Court for Republican donors, <clears throat> funded that with checks as big as $17 million. I think a rational person would look at somebody writing a check for $17 million and have a very reasonable question what interest they had before the court, but we don't know that because all of this was dark money and all was secret. And some of the behavior around this has been pretty mysterious, and I'll just give a quick overview here. We started with this pairing of the Judicial Crisis Network and the Judicial Education Project, both funded by a dark money funding group called Wellspring. And as they uh, went forward, we found out that <clears throat> they were paired physically as well. And their address was actually the same address as the Federalist Society, through which the court capture turnstile was being run. In fact, they're down the hall from each other. A little bit more on that later. 
And then at the end of 19, some peculiar corporate permutations were done, which is that the Judicial Crisis Network renamed itself as the Concord Fund, and the Judicial Education Project renamed itself as the 85 Fund, and then they both set up fictitious names for themselves with Concord Fund reviving Judicial Crisis Network as one fictitious name, but also going on to Honest Elections Project Action, which is their voter suppression effort. And similarly, the Judicial Education Project set up a fictitious name for itself as its former name, Judicial Election Project, while also adding Honest Elections Project. That was done in early 20, after the name change at the end of 19. And here's the rule under Virginia corporate law setting up this fictitious name process that they went through. And this is the guy, Leonard Leo, who the Washington Post dis disclosed as being in the middle of what was then described as a $250 million web of court capture operations, and which a hearing in my courts committee showed to be a $400 million now operation um, as more of the information has been revealed. And at the end of the day, once it was clear that Trump wasn't going to win the election, that he was a loser in the making, and after the Washington Post expose kind of blew up Leonard Leo's role in the court capture scheme, he jumped from the Federal Society down the hall and became the person running the Honest Elections Project. So there's an element here of kind of hide the pea under the walnuts, but clearly the hundreds of millions of dollars that went into the Leonard Leo court capture operation documented by the Washington Post expose is now behind the so-called Honest Elections Project, the uh, latest iteration in this dark money voter suppression effort, and um, obviously very aligned with the Heritage Action group that we caught in action talking about what they had done to press this through the um, state legislatures. So if you don't look at who's behind all this, it's hard to kind of get the joke about what's really going on, and I want to just make sure that the record of this hearing has taken us through the uh, special interest dark money funding that has been behind this operation, and I appreciate the chairman indulging me in, allowing, in that presentation. Thanks, Senator Whitehouse. Senator Lee. Mr. Chairman, I was surprised, a little stunned, to hear some of our witnesses suggest and some of our members seem to agree, at least in part, that uh, requiring of an identification form, a photo ID, is somehow racially discriminatory. Raises all sorts of questions in my mind. Is our entire healthcare system racist? Are pharmacies racist? The airline industry, is that racist? The TSA? What about bars? You go into a bar? I mean, some people consider a form of flattery, I guess, if they get carded, but, um, you know, it, it happens, and they're re required to ask for IDs. Many of them do as a matter of policy. What about universities? One thing I've learned about all colleges and universities these days, they all, they all issue a student ID and they have photos on them. Make sure that the privileges associated with that university aren't being used improperly by someone else. What, are like, what about Major League Baseball, the NFL, or all other event organizers who require you to show an ID when you go to pick up your tickets? Are they all racist? That would be news to me. It's certainly not racist to require someone to prove who they are in order to gain access to government benefits of one sort or another. It's never been deemed such. So why all of a sudden are we calling it that when people are just wanting to vote? Now, now some people will, will say on the other side, is, oh, well, this is different. It's the right, right to vote. We, Got to have as many people voting as possible. Well, well, hang on just a minute. 
you don't have some process of verifying that the person is who the person says he or she is, then what happens? Well, what happens is that you have a very significant risk that someone will vote when they're not supposed to, when they're not allowed, or somebody will vote multiple times, perhaps many multiple times. When that happens, you have disenfranchisement. You have disenfranchisement of those who are entitled to vote. So if these things are racist, then that's news to me. And we've got a much bigger problem with all these industries that I've just mentioned. But of course, none of this is true because this is absolute nonsense. We have the ability, in fact, we have a duty, not we, because we're not the ones who control uh, voting rolls. That is up to the states. The Constitution goes out of its way to make sure that that's up to the states. The states have the obligation, they have the opportunity, they have the duty to make sure that there is confidence in our voting system, and that's why they do it. Mr. Von Spakovsky, uh, H.R. 4, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, not only creates updated form formulas for jurisdictional preclearance, but it, it also creates a new form of preclearance triggered by practices that many progressives fear, loathe, in fact. Uh, now, ironically, these practices are widely popular with voters across the political spectrum. Right which raises all sorts of questions as the progressives might fear them, but let's set that aside for a minute. Because they are popular, uh, and they're popular specifically because they ensure the, the, the integrity and the potency and the legitimacy of each ballot. They include, among other things, uh, voter ID requirements and efforts to maintain the integrity of voter registration files, to make sure that someone who has died or moved out of, moved out of state or... or uh, otherwise is ineligible to vote in the jurisdiction in question, doesn't vote, and thereby disenfranchise those who are entitled to vote in that jurisdiction. How would these practice-based um, uh, these practice-based preclearance provisions in HR 4 ensure that most, if not all, voting jurisdictions in the United States are forced into the even more burdensome jurisdiction-based preclearance process? Well, the problem with this practice-based preclearance, particularly the one applying to the cleanup of voter rolls, is the, I, I know the attitude of the career people inside the voting section, Maureen Reardon has talked about it, and they oppose almost any cleanup of voter rolls, any attempt to make sure they're accurate. And you can see this in all the lawsuits that have been filed. You'll, you'll recall that a lawsuit in Ohio went all the way to the Supreme Court, the Houston decision. And this- but they're neutral, aren't they? <laughs> they're yeah. You can trust them, can't you? Yeah, I think so, right. Uh, but, but here's the thing that people forget about this whole claim that somehow uh, maintaining voter registration systems uh, leads to discrimination. First of all, states are strictly regulated in what they can do by the National Voter Registration Act. It sets out very strict rules on what you can do to clean up voter rolls. And second, this constant claim I hear that, oh, you know, cleaning up voter rolls, taking off people who have died or moved away, it, it disenfranchises voters. Well, that also ignores the fact that this Congress passed in 2002 the Help America Vote Act. In fact, 92 senators voted in favor of it. That put in a provisional balloting provision. So even if a state makes a mistake, you know, they remove somebody from the voter roll because they think they've moved out of state and they don't, all that person, when they show up at their polling place and they're told, listen, you're not on the list, we, we thought you had moved, they are federally entitled to a provisional ballot. They simply have to declare, no, I'm eligible, I was registered. They are given a provisional ballot, election officials then investigate, and if a mistake was made, their ballot counts. So people are not going to be disenfranchised even if a mistake is made. M Mr. Chairman, I see my time's expired. I've got one follow-up question I'd like to ask Ms. Reardon, if that's okay. Uh, if it's quick, yeah, yeah. We, we, I should tell the members we have a vote underway right now. Understood. Uh, Ms. Reardon, uh, under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, still fully intact, still fully intact regardless of whether this ever becomes law, is there any reason why that's inadequate to address these? Is there any argument to be made that the Section 2 violations going on are so rampant, so out of control, 
uh, as Congress concluded they were at the time of the original passage of sections four and five, that they can't keep up with this? Uh, I, I don't believe so. Section two, um, especially the way that it has been enlarged um, to include an effect portion to section two, really targets um, intentional discrimination as well. And that is consistent with Shelby. Um, and so although there's been some testimony here that section two is expensive and it's long, it is certainly within you know, the powers of the 15th Amendment. And it also um, provides DOJ what it needs, and that is to target areas within the United States that are discriminating, as opposed to making everybody in the United States subject to Section 5 when there's no basis for it. Um, I will say that DOJ, since the Shelby decision, has only brought approximately six Section 2 cases, their last one being um, the one that they filed in Georgia. I would say that's pretty indicative that there's not rampant discrimination um, within the United States, because DOJ is certainly not there filing lawsuits. Thank you. I will yield to uh, Senator Klobuchar for her questions, and she will chair. Uh, in my absence, I'm going to go vote, and I'll be running right back. And then if she has to leave and I'm not back, if she could <laughs> yield to Senator Padilla. Sounds like a good plan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, uh, Ranking Member Cruz, for this important hearing. Um, we know the right to vote is fundamental, and we have several important bills uh, coming before us. The first, of course, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, Mr. Yang, could you talk about why it's important that the reauthorization include preclearance formulas that are geographic and practice-based? Thank you very, very much for that question, Senator Klobuchar. It's important because we recognize that for minority communities, especially the Latino community and the Asian American community, we're rapidly growing in jurisdictions that are oftentimes not covered by the jurisdictions that would have been historically covered under the coverage formula. Thus, having a practice-based preclearance system sets in place to allow for, again, we should remember it's dual triggers. One is the percentage of individuals in that community must, as a demographic matter, reach a certain level. But second is to look at the practice involved. If the practice was historically one that could be used to discriminate against communities, then that would trigger preclearance. I think the other important thing to remember about this, going back to what uh, Mr. Science testified about, is that this provides a form of ADR. Really, it allows for efficient and effective means for looking at uh, different types of manners of voting before they become into law, rather than the costly and very expensive time-consuming aspect of trying to do litigation afterwards. Okay, very good. Thank you. That's very well said. Um, uh, Mr. Sainz, uh, you know, we had this Rules Committee had the first field hearing in 20 years in Georgia, and we learned about their law. I'm going to get to the uh, Freedom to Vote Act in a minute, but um, and I, I don't think, I think a lot of the publicity, understandably, about it has been, oh, no water or food in line from non poverty But when you really look at it, it's really quite extraordinarily bad. And this is why so many major companies um, have come out against it. Uh, it is things like you can't vote on weekends during the runoff period, and you can before it, leading to maximum confusion and, of course, inability for many people to vote who thought they could on a weekend. Um, writing your birthday on the inside envelope on the outside, and, of course, many voters think they should write the date that they cast their ballot. Duh. And instead, uh, it's your birthday. Um, the uh, lack, the limitation on ballot uh, mail drop-in ballot boxes and the like, and the fact that you can register 29 days before and the runoff is 28 days before. I, I don't know what else you need to know in the words of the North Carolina court in another case uh, that it is discrimination with, in their words, about another law, surgical precision. Uh, what is the impact, in just 30 seconds here, because I want to go on to something else, the impact on the laws uh, in Georgia on voter participation, particularly among voters of color and voters in rural areas? It's potentially very significant. Every time you make it more complicated, more difficult, you are not facilitating a vote, and that's particularly going to have impacts on less frequent voters, those who are newer voters, whether because they're naturalized or only recently uh, turned 18. Uh, and those who are elderly. So those are the effects of all of these laws. And I will just add very quickly, Senator, going back to what Mr. Yang said, it's these kinds of crafty laws why we need both coverage formulas, because we won't get the new approaches, new ways of suppressing the vote 
under practice-based coverage because it's yeah. limited to what's specified. But under geographic trigger, we Both will things. get the new crafty ways of suppressing the vote. Right, exactly. So let's talk about that with you, my last series of questions here, Ms. Tolson. Thank you for being here. Um, the crafty ways and what's happening. So um, I am dismayed that voting rights has always been bipartisan in the past. I remember growing up in Minnesota and the League of Women Voters, and we were proud of our voter turnout. And I'll note that many of the provisions in the For the People bill and now the more negotiated with Senator Manchin and others, the Freedom to Vote Act, um, which I'm really proud of uh, that uh, he worked with me on this through the summer. Um, these provisions get at things that to me are common sense, uh, mail-in voting that we know so many voters, Democrats and Republicans, uh, use through the pandemic. Just the information we got out of that pandemic where you know, uh, so many people voted most ever in the middle of a public health crisis, why not use those? In my state, these laws where we usually have the highest voter turnout in the country, I have seen what's happened. We've elected Democratic governors uh, in our current governor, Tim Walz. We've elected Republican governors with these voting laws and Tim Pawlenty. Uh, we, have we have even elected Jesse Ventura. And what's the, what's the thing about it to me? And you've seen this in other states that have strong voting laws. What is it? Well, it, it means more people feel like they're part of a democracy. And they may come up to me and say, well, I didn't vote for you, but I do agree with you on something like this. They're part of the democracy. We make it easier for them to be part of the democracy. So, Professor Tolson, um, over 83% of likely voters support public disclosure of contributions, like we have the Disclose Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. Uh, even 57% of likely Republican voters support nonpartisan redistricting um, uh, commissions. 65% uh, uh, support the option to vote early. Um, you just go through the line. The people are with us on this. Could you talk about why it is appropriate to characterize the um, provisions in the Freedom to Vote Act as actually for America and not as some of our colleagues are doing as partisan? So I like to think of the, uh, the act, actually both HR 1 and HR 4 together, but HR exactly. 1 in, in particular is, it's, it's really a list of best practices, right? You, you look at what states are doing and you, you incorporate those, pack, those practices into a bill that can make sure we have a healthy democracy. So it, for example, independent commissions to draw district lines are, is something that has worked well in states that have adopted them. Um, and that's something that we can apply at a national level in order to decrease the, the uh, instances of uh, partisan gerrymandering. But coupled with that, HR 4 is a way of protecting minority communities that have historically experienced discrimination, which is also an aspect of a healthy democracy. So I think it's important to view these two bills together to the extent that we're trying to respond to the ways in which voter suppression has evolved. Um, Congress has to evolve too, because voter suppression has certainly evolved. And history has shown that if we don't stay on top of it, then it could definitely take us back 100 years. Thank you very much. Next up. Okay, um, uh, Senator Ossoff, I understand, has logged into WebEx. Uh, thank you for the recognition and thanks to our panel for joining us today. Professor Tolson, uh, until 2013, until the Shelby County Beholder decision, Georgia and jurisdictions within Georgia had to pre-approve changes to voting laws with the Civil Rights Division at the Department of Justice in accordance with Section 5 of the VRA. After the Shelby County decision gutted Section 5, preclearance was no longer a barrier and the state and jurisdictions within it were free to enact changes without federal oversight. And that's exactly what we've seen. And I want to highlight in particular the closure of polling places in Georgia. At least 214 polling places in Georgia have been closed since the Shelby County Beholder decision was made. And We've seen that the impact of these closures uh, has been most profoundly felt by minority voters and in minority communities. So Professor Tolson, my question for you, what threat do polling place closures and relocations pose to voting access and why therefore is known practices coverage, which we're discussing today in this hearing, a necessary tool to mitigate that threat and protect ballot access? 
Thank you, Senator. It's, it's, incredible, it's incredibly important, in part because in Georgia in particular, you saw the strategic closure of polling places in uh, minority areas. And this led to 9, 10, 11 hour waits in some uh, parts of uh, uh, Fulton County in particular. But uh, statewide, you definitely had problems with uh, voters having to wait in line for a long time. I think there's this perception that the, uh, the pandemic caused a lot of this, right? But you had increased rates of absentee voting. You still have voters waiting in line to vote in person for a really long time. And this is in part a response to, to Shelby County. Since 20, since 2013, um, the jurisdictions formerly covered by Section 5 have closed on average 20% more polling places than uh, jurisdictions in the rest of the country. So the problem that we saw in Georgia is something that is, is very widespread and pra practice-based preclearance will help mitigate some of that. Thank you, Professor Tolson. And some opponents of preclearance requirements have said it's too hard for jurisdictions to prove to the Justice Department that changes would not harm ballot access for minority voters. Is that true? Is it reasonable to expect that a jurisdiction understands the impact of changes to voting access on minority voters before making that change? And is it reasonable to presume good intent on the part of those same actors? Yes, Senator, I would think that jurisdictions would perform this, this sort of cost benefit analysis prior to determining whether or not to close a polling place. Um, if they have done so, then it shouldn't be administratively difficult for them to prove that they are, uh, that they need to close the polling place. I would also point out that under the prior coverage formula, um, hundreds of jurisdictions comply with the Voting Rights Act administratively um, with no problem. We tend to focus on the bad actors and the fact that they litigate changes for years and years and years. Uh, but in reality, this is not a huge administrative lift for most jurisdictions who are acting in good faith. Thank you, Professor Tolson. Redistricting is one of the practices that Congress is considering including in a covered practices provision of the John Lewis legislation. What is the best evidence that redistricting poses a particular threat to racial and language minority voters? Is that also for me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Um, so redistricting, especially now as we are at, at the beginning of our, uh, uh, the redistricting that occurs at the beginning of the decade, uh, minority communities are in, in this moment very, very in very weak positions because uh, many of the many states have passed restrictive voting laws, and in those states you'll see efforts to try to gerrymander uh, racial minorities into districts, which is something that was extensively litigated over the last decade. So cases came out of uh, North Carolina, out of Alabama, out of Texas, where uh, state legislatures tried to pack minority voters into districts, claiming that the Voting Rights Act required them to do so, um, uh, an argument that the Supreme Court ultimately rejected. And so as we enter into this next round of redistricting, we will see more efforts to try to suppress the political power of minority communities by packing them into districts and also cracking them across districts, which is why practice-based preclearance is so important. Thank you, Professor Tolson. Madam Chair, my final question for Mr. Yang. Mr. Yang, over the past 20 years, the number of Georgians who identify as Asian American has more than doubled and nationwide Asian Americans are the fastest growing demographic segment of eligible voters. Why, in your view, is passage of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act critical to protecting voting rights and ballot access for immigrant communities and minority communities like the Asian American community? And why, in your view, is it vital to require pre-approval before states can enact changes like redistricting or closing polling places, please? Thank you for that question. Certainly because Asian Americans are so rapidly growing in the United States in many places that people don't expect, such as Georgia, it's important to have the Modernized Voting Rights Act be passed to protect the, the rights of Asian Americans, really to make sure that they, have the, that they are able to exercise their voice in democracy. Specifically with respect to the practice-based preclearance, the, the key thing to remember here is that Asian Americans are appearing in places that traditionally have not had minorities, whether it's in Nevada, whether it's in Arkansas, whether it is in other more remote or rural places. And if, if we are only look at historical, uh, historical geographies, then we may miss the growth of Asian Americans and other communities of color in those geographies. That's why it's also necessary to include practice-based preclearance as a complement to the coverage formula under Section 5. Thank you, Mr. Yang, and thank you, Madam Chair. I yield. Thank you, uh, Senator Ossoff. At this point, uh, 
I believe it's uh, my turn to hold a virtual gavel here for a minute and uh, proceed with my questions. I want to thank all the uh, witnesses again for your participation today. Uh, I, uh, a couple of issues I want to touch on, beginning with the myth of voter fraud. You know, um, voter fraud, if you look at the data, is uh, exceedingly rare in the United States. Uh, and yet this data that I looked at repeatedly in my prior capacity as California Secretary of State. Uh, so I'll say it again. Voter fraud is exceedingly rare in the United States. In election after election, including this, the November 2020 election, we see little evidence of the massive or widespread voter fraud that uh, some political figures would want you to believe and be afraid of. Uh, nonetheless, this myth of voter fraud is used as a pretext uh, to uh, suggest and pass unnecessary voting measures or changes to election laws whose only real effect is to make it harder for eligible voters, particularly minority voters, to cast a ballot. Some of us have recognized that already in this hearing. Uh, my f uh, first question is to Mr. Sines, if you can uh, continue to expand on how this myth of voter fraud is weaponized against increasingly ascendant minority communities uh, in particular, the country is only becoming more diverse by the day, and uh, I'd like to, I'd like for us to focus on creating as an inclusive democracy as possible, not less so. Mr. Sainz. Absolutely, the mythology around voter fraud is used by its constant repetition, despite no evidence of anything other than isolated and often inadvertent voter fraud in the form of those who are not eligible actually casting a ballot. Isolated instances often inadvertent. And the other form of voter fraud that is a myth and put out there is the notion of voter intimidation. Precious little evidence of any voter intimidation where someone is coerced into voting against their actual views uh, doesn't happen. But that's often weaponized against remote voting. But what happens is the myth of voter fraud becomes an imperative to act to protect election integrity, even if elections are really have a great, great deal of integrity already. And so you see the enactment, as in Georgia, as in Texas, of new measures that make it more complicated to vote. And as you know, that has a particular effect on newer voters, whether they're newer because they've just decided to register or they just became eligible through naturalization or age. Uh, eligible to vote. But for newer voters and often for longtime voters who are elderly, these complicating factors do not facilitate participation. They actually deter and in some cases prevent participation. And that's where we see the discriminatory effects. And it in turn goes back to why we often see racially discriminatory intent. Because there is an understanding that some of these measures will in fact have their greatest impact on minority voting communities. Okay. And, and back to uh, the, the myth of voter fraud, fact versus fiction or myth versus data. Uh, in this hearing, we heard a lot of back and forth about voter ID, the role of voter ID, the, the, uh, the fact that many states have a voter ID law. Is there any data uh, that you can point us to that suggests voter ID is actually a solution to a problem or is it a solution in search of a problem. Does voter ID do more good in preventing voter fraud or more bad in terms of making it harder for eligible people to vote or actually disenfranchise eligible voters from participating? Well, the fact is it's hard to demonstrate any impact because there is no evidence of significant voter fraud. So it is a problem that doesn't exist. So how do you demonstrate that you're actually addressing it? I will point out that anyone who's really interested in engaging in fraudulent voting and ineligible voter can very easily uh, obtain a fraudulent ID. It's not hard. I mean, that's why these examples given by Senator Lee really are not relevant because we see voter, we see fraud in those circumstances, whether it's at a bar, as he suggested, or in accessing benefits. We see fraud using fraudulent ID in those circumstances. So it's absolutely unclear that voter ID has any effect other than to make it more difficult often involving cost and time for those to obtain a voter ID that they've never had before because usually where it's had its, uh, its most pernicious impact, the limits on what IDs are acceptable is critical. I can point out Senator Lee used school IDs as an example, and yet school IDs in the state of Texas are not allowed as a voter ID. So that's the kind of problems that we see. There's really no match between non-existent voter fraud and what voter ID is intended to do.
but your concealed weapons permit is allowed in Texas. So there you go. Uh, next question is for both uh, uh, Mr. Yang and M Professor Tolson. Uh, we've talked uh, during the course of the hearing about the geographic-based approach versus the practice-based approach um, under the uh, formula for the Voting Rights Act. Uh, we know that uh, it, it covers certain jurisdictions uh, who since then, or over the last 55 years, certainly since 2013, have uh, experienced significant demographic change, but there's also non-covered jurisdictions where Asian American community, Latino community, African American community, others are uh, continuing to diversify those populations. Can you just shed a little bit more light on the nuance between you know, previously covered versus non-covered and the significance of geographic-based versus practice-based uh, uh, protections here? Well, one of the beauties of practice-based coverage is that it avoids some of the stigma that the Supreme Court, Court talked about in Shelby County with respect to suggesting that certain states fall under stigma by falling under the geographic provisions. Here, under practice-based coverage, we are looking at historic practices that have been used to disenfranchise essentially communities of color. We should say all, all vulnerable voters, but it really has been more on communities of color. And so by focusing there with some precision as to what practices we are talking about, we add, add a layer of coverage that would give protection to those communities that are emerging in places that have historically not seen minority voters. I don't have much to add, but I will point out that one of the benefits of having practice-based coverage is that it's significantly more tailored than Section 4B was in its original form because it focuses on specific practices and also picks a demographic threshold that um, is, is, is really important because it's really at a point where minority communities are starting to reach numbers where they can influence the outcome of an election. Um, and then that coupled with some geographic coverage, which would allow the statute to get at voting rights violators. Um, it, 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 having geographic coverage and practice-based uh, preclearance together um, in a way that effectively addresses the concerns raised by the court in Shelby County is a much tailored, narrowly tailored and better way to approach the issue of voting rights violations now. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Chair, before uh, I turn it back over, um, just want to, uh, for more, more of a comment, not really a question, but to lay a marker for an issue that I'd love to work with you on going forward. And that is this, we've discussed voter ID, uh, how it's problematic. We've, uh, uh, in practice, become familiar with, sometimes it's not an exact uh, name match, how, you, how it appears in the voter registration roles versus an ID, particularly in the Latino community, when sometimes you have multiple last names. Sometimes uh, government administrators will erroneously shift one of your last names to your middle name, you know, et cetera, those sorts of things. We've talked about language issues and the role of better training for poll workers, for example, to better serve language minorities who are citizens of age, registered to vote, eligible, but sometimes face barriers to voter participation. I know in California, we've been working with advocacy organizations to uh, provide uh, better training for poll workers to better serve the LGBTQ community, particularly uh, trans voters. Eligible voters, citizens who may not present themselves in person when coming to vote uh, in the same way they may appear on a voter registration roll or even on their ID uh, when showing up to vote in a voter ID state. So uh, some research to be done there, some best practices to uh, research, and uh, we'll love to uh, bring forward uh, some opportunities to buttress that nationally, not just uh, in California. Thanks, Senator Padilla. Uh, I'm going to ask a few questions, and my colleague, Senator Cruz, is on the way back from a vote. But um, let me just say, um, a lot has been said here today about turnout. Uh, my colleagues have cited the record high turnout, as they put it, of minority voters as evidence that the federal protections under the Voting Rights Act are no longer needed or don't need to be restored. Uh, this argument seems to be premised in part on the fact that prior coverage formulas relied on voter registration and voter turnout rates to identify jurisdictions for coverage, and those rates have increased substantially since 1965. Uh, 
I think we ought to celebrate that minor, minority voter registration turnout has, in fact, reached historic heights. In fact, we have the Voting Rights Act to thank for that development. And now that the Voting Rights Act has been hobbled, impeded, undercut, even eviscerated, we see that minority voting rights are under attack again. And that's the reason that we're here, to make sure that turnout is protected. Uh, the census 2020 voter registration and turnout data show that even with these historic levels of turnout, voter registration and turnout rates among black, Hispanic, Asian voters is below that of whites across the country in almost every state. Uh, isn't it true, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Yang and Mr. Sands, uh, that though there are significant racial turnout gaps between minority and white voters, uh, are, isn't it true that there are these gaps, uh, Mr. Sines and Mr. Yang? Uh, Absolutely. There are still significant gaps, particularly faced in the Latino community, and it is taken advantage of by some decision makers. I gave an example in my written testimony of Pasadena, Texas. One of the very first changes made after the Shelby County decision was in Pasadena, Texas, where the city council was on the very cusp of having a Latino elected majority. So the mayor came forward and said he was going to do something he wanted to do before but couldn't under preclearance because he knew he couldn't get away with it, was, was, which was to shift two of the eight seats on that city council to at-large elections. He knew that because of the turnout gap that you've just described, those two at-large seats would, for the foreseeable future, be elected by white voters, even though under an eight-district system, he knew that Latino voters would, in fact, choose a majority of the city council. So there is still a significant turnout gap, despite many efforts to address it, and it is exploited by some of those who engage in these practices. Mr. Yang. Certainly within the Asian American community, there is both a registration gap and a turnout gap. Uh, although we have tried to make up ground in that respect through hard activism by many groups, that gap still remains when compared to white voters. The other thing I would mention is that uh, there's been references made to the 2020 elections and the record voter turnout for the 2020 elections. I think although that happened during a pandemic, that also happened during a time where we opened up the franchise of voting in a way that bipartisan people have agreed that had, had, was a secure election. There were not any major instances of voter fraud that would have changed the elections. So that, from that perspective, that experiment seemed to have worked. So to suggest that we should go back to the old ways when we knew that voter turnout lagged in, under the old system seems to be really a defeat for democracy. Because if we are trying to have a democracy where we want to have as many eligible citizens vote, then we should open up the franchise in a way that while maintaining security, allows more people to vote. Uh, has that turnout gap changed since the Shelby County decision? In other words, um, in jurisdictions that were previously covered by preclearance, has there been a change in particular? Unfortunately for the Asian American community, we don't have very good data on that. What we do know is that the Asian American community still has a, a registration and turnout gap. One of the most frequent reasons that is cited is confusion over where polling places are, confusion over what voter registration requirements are, are necessary, uh, and, and the language gap that accompanies that. I'm going to put in the record uh, two uh, documents from the Brennan Center, which answer in part the question I just raised. Uh, overall, these documents show the in the 2020 election, 70.9% uh, of white voters cast ballots, while only 58.4% of non-white voters did. There's a lot more information in these documents, which I think supports the points that you have just made. Uh, let me ask Mr. Sines and Professor Tolson, in your written testimony, you both discuss extensively the concept of minority community of, of uh, reaching a tipping point at which they become perceived as a political threat. And the result is potentially a community backlash. Uh, how does the known practices coverage formula uh, 
which is central to this legislation, address this concept of a tipping point at which voter discrimination becomes more likely? It, it addresses it, Senator, by recognizing uh, that these are jurisdictions that often have not had a long history of voter suppression and voter discrimination simply because their minority communities weren't large enough to be perceived as a threat and therefore to trigger action against them. Absent some threat to those in power, you don't usually see any reason to engage in, in voter discrimination. This recognizes that the geographic trigger, as important as it is, will not cover jurisdictions that don't have that history and are for the first time seeing a minority group of voters as a threat. Pasadena, Texas that I just cited in response to your last question is an example of that. That's what happened there. And that's what Known's Practices Coverage or Practice-Based Coverage is designed to address. Ms. Tolson. The, de the, demogra the demographic trigger of 20% is actually very important because that is a number where minorities are starting to reach a threshold where they can influence the, uh, the political process. And it's not uncommon for jurisdictions to take uh, discriminatory actions against uh, minority populations, even if their numbers are small. Um, for example, in my written testimony, I talk about District 24 in Texas, where African Americans were only about 25% of the district, but they were the swing voting block, and that district was dismantled after Texas redistrict um, its uh, legislative districts in 2003. Um, so it's not uncommon for minority groups to experience um, their political power being challenged, even when they are in, in small numbers. So the demographic trigger of 20% is very important for that reason. And I presume you would agree that the demographic trigger and other provisions of this bill respond to the points made in Shelby County for striking down the preclearance formula under that previous legislation. Absolutely. So the Shelby County Court was predominantly concerned about the tailoring of the statute, right? And so the demographic trigger is an effort to tailor the, the reach of the statute as opposed to applying it to all jurisdictions um, for certain specific covered practices. It, it targets those jurisdictions that have minority populations in, in significant numbers uh, where that, that population could face some backlash. I said in my opening statement that the legislation is narrowly tailored and targeted because of these provisions, for example, the 20% trigger provision. Mm -hmm. Perhaps you can explain to folks, apparently some of my colleagues who don't understand that narrowly tailored approach. So in Shelby County, the Supreme Court invalidated Section 4B's coverage formula because the court found that it was uh, both over-inclusive and under-inclusive. Over-inclusive in the sense that jurisdictions who had committed no wrongdoing were required to pre-clear all the changes to their election laws. And under-inclusive in the sense that jurisdictions that were engaging in bad behavior didn't have to uh, comply with pre-clearance. And so practice-based preclearance is important because it targets specific practices that have a history of being used to disenfranchise minority populations. And it also focuses on jurisdictions with substantial numbers of, uh, of members of minority groups. And so it, it is a direct effort to respond to the tailoring problem, and the, the demographic trigger does that. A lot of been, has been also said about the constitutional authority here. Mm -hmm. As you know, Congress has traditionally and historically drawn on the 14th and 15th Amendments as its source of authority in supporting the VRA's uh, Voting Rights Act's preclearance authority. Would you agree that they apply here? And um, I would also argue that the Elections Clause provides an additional source of authority for this measure. Absolutely. Um, one of the disadvantages of uh, the litigation posture in Shelby County is that the court focused exclusively on the 14th and 15th Amendments and didn't consider the Elections Clause, even though the Elections Clause is a broad source of authority for Congress to make or alter state regulations. Um, the 14th and 15th Amendments are important, too, and to some extent the Shelby County Court ignores the fact that the 14th Amendment protects a fundamental right to vote that Congress can protect through appropriate legislation. Instead, the court focuses on the fact that the 15th Amendment requires uh, proof of intentional racial discrimination in voting. Uh, but Congress's authority is much broader than that. Mr. Yang or Mr. Sainz, do you have um, any comments on that question? I absolutely agree with Professor Tolson. It's quite clear that Congress's authority is broad. 
and it's been recognized by the Supreme Court in the past with respect specifically to preclearance, though limited by Shelby County. And as she has indicated, practice-based coverage is a direct response to those concerns on both the side of federalism, too much intrusion in the court's view, majority's view, and on the issue of equal sovereignty. So it responds to changes in the Supreme Court's analysis, but otherwise, consistently, the Supreme Court has recognized broad authority in the area of protecting the fundamental right to vote and under the Elections Clause. Thank you. Uh, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's an unfortunate reality of today's politics that, that Democrats do not believe in democracy. They believe in power. It speaks volumes that S-1, the very first bill introduced by Chuck Schumer and the Democrats in this Senate, is a bill for the federal government to take over elections and to strike down virtually every reasonable voter integrity law adopted across the country. It is likewise the case that H.R. 1, the first bill introduced by Nancy Pelosi, is the same bill, a federal takeover of elections designed to strike down virtually every reasonable voter integrity law in the country. The priority of Democrats is not COVID, as the rhetoric might suggest. The priority of Democrats is not jobs. The priority of Democrats is not our national security. The priority of Democrats is to ensure that Democrats stay in power no matter what. No matter what the voters think, this bill before us is designed to prevent those pesky voters from ever making a decision other than electing Democrats. And it's a long tradition. Jim Crow was exactly the same thing. Democratic politicians writing laws, changing the election laws to ensure the voters could only elect Democrats. Sadly, there are decades of ugly history behind this. You know, before I was in the Senate, I was a constitutional litigator and Supreme Court litigator. I didn't do a lot of redistricting law, but I did in 2003 and 2004 and 2005 represent the state of Texas in the redistricting litigation that occurred then. And I have to say I agree with Chief Justice Roberts who described in one voting rights case, it is a sordid business this divvying us up by race because that is much of what redistricting law is right now. It is focused on, in that case, we heard testimony. We heard testimony actually from African-American elected Democrats in Texas about the racist history of Democrats in Texas. And in particular, when the state legislature in 2003 passed a new congressional redistricting map, it was replacing a map that had been passed by Democrats in Texas that had been widely described as the most egregious gerrymander in the country. It was a map that even though a substantial majority of Texans were voting consistently Republican, elected Democrats and a large majority of congressional Democrats despite the views of the voters. And Democrats fought tooth and nail, including fleeing to Ardmore, Oklahoma, including fleeing to Albuquerque, New Mexico to try to keep their partisan gerrymander in place to elect Democrats, even though the voters didn't want to elect Democrats. And the testimony we heard at trial from African-American elected Democrats was that the strategy of white Democrats to elect white Democrats was very simple. A moment ago, we heard about thresholds of minority representations in districts. The testimony we heard at trial is that white Democrats knew that if you put a sufficient number of African-American voters in a district, but not too many, and a sufficient number of Hispanic voters in a district, but not too many, that in the primary, that the African-American Democratic voters would join with white Democratic voters in voting against an Hispanic Democrat, and that the Hispanic Democratic voters would join with white Democratic voters in voting against a black Democrat. And the result would be exactly what happened in Texas. White Democrats would win the primaries, and then those minority voters would vote for Democrats in the general, and it would ensure that white Democrats stay in power in perpetuity. Texas legislature, the Republican legislature, eliminated that gerrymander and resulted in a map that actually elected a congressional delegation that reflected the views of the voters of Texas. And Democratic activists viewed that as an abomination. Why? Because their objective is to elect Democrats. In the state of Texas, I'm the first Hispanic ever elected as a U.S. Senator. 
the activists who are engaged on these issues did not celebrate that issue because you are not Hispanic if you are not Democrat in their view. Never mind that every time I've been on the ballot in Texas, over 40% of Hispanics have voted for me. Never mind that Texas is the only majority minority state in the union that consistently elects Republicans. That arouses the ire of Democratic activists. Because we minorities aren't supposed to think for ourselves. In fact, we're told by enlightened Democrats that we Hispanics are too dumb to figure out how to get a driver's license. I'll be damned. We can't drive a car. We can't get on a plane. We can't get married. We're just not smart enough. It's offensive and it's ridiculous. It's why the overwhelming majority of Americans support photo ID, because they know the Democrats. They don't even believe what they're saying. They know that. This is about political power. That's what it's all about. And what does this bill say? If you believe in democracy, what do you want? If you believe in democracy, you want the voters to be able to vote for policies they support. That would mean if the voters support for policies like photo ID, you should have a photo ID law. That, this bill says, no, 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 no. You voters are not smart enough to know that. We're going to take the power away from you by giving it to unelected bureaucrats who can strike down what an entire state legislature, in Texas our legislature is elected by 29 million people. One bureaucrat at the Department of Justice has more power under this bill than 29 million people in the state of Texas. You want to talk about something offensive to democracy, saying one bureaucrat at DOJ has more power to enact laws than 29 million voters going and exercising the Democratic franchise. You know, earlier in this hearing, we heard testimony about discrimination against Asian Americans. I agree, there's a lot of discrimination against Asian Americans. Some of the most egregious discrimination against Asian Americans occurs in elite academic institutions like Harvard and Yale and Princeton that discriminate against Asian Americans, that have quotas against Asian Americans. I'm a graduate of Princeton and Harvard. The chairman is a graduate of Yale. All of those institutions have quotas that are every bit as noxious as the quotas in the 50s and 60s against Jews. They were enforced against Jews. We don't want too many Jews is what those academic institutions said. Now they say, we don't want too many Asian Americans. We're going to have reverse quotas. What's one of the very first things the Biden Department of Justice did? The Civil Rights Division. They dismissed the lawsuit from the U.S. Department of Justice against Yale University for discriminating against Asian Americans. Because politically, they support that discrimination. And I would note, by the way, earlier this year, when voting on a bill on Asian American discrimination, I introduced an amendment. It was a one-paragraph amendment that said federal funds shall not flow to any educational institution that discriminates against Asian Americans in admissions or in granting scholarships. It was straightforward, it was simple, and every single Democrat in the United States Senate voted against it. Every single Democrat said, in effect, we support discriminating against Asian Americans when it suits our politics. This ain't about protecting the rights of voters. This is about keeping Democrats in power. Ms. Reardon, you've served in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. Can, can you tell this committee the extent to which that division has exercised partisan decision making in your experience? One of the most egregious um, situations that I've observed is when the city of Kinston, North Carolina, submitted a change uh, for preclearance wherein they were no, no longer going to um, run on a party. They wanted to run nonpartisan. And this is an African-American majority city. So the African-Americans controlled um, you know, the, uh, the city council who wanted to make that change. And um, the department objected to the change because um, it felt, and in its letter, it said basically that if there was no D next to the name of the candidates, then the African Americans would no longer get elected and they would not know who to vote for. So they were clearly protecting 
the Democrat Party, and they were also insulting the African Americans that live within the city of Kinston, as well as the elected officials. Well, unfortunately, there's a lot of protecting the Democratic Party and insulting African American voters and Hispanic voters in the process. Mr. Chairman, I have in front of me a statement from Steve Marshall, who's the Attorney General of Alabama, who has submitted a statement that describes, responds to charges that voter integrity laws are unnecessary uh, and cites, among other things, two Alabama mayoral elections in 2016 that were overturned because of voter fraud. So I ask unanimous consent that this uh, statement be included in the record. Without objection. Uh, we ought to be protecting democracy. We shouldn't be neither party should be engaged in partisan efforts to stay in power. But I would note, it is the Democrats in Congress who have set their very first priority keeping Democrats in power. Democracy be damned. Uh, we are here because we want more people to vote. We want to remove obstacles to vote. We want to increase access, regardless of how they vote, what party they're in. That is the narrowly tailored and targeted purpose of the measure before us. Uh, I'd like to give you an opportunity, Mr. Sines, to respond to some of what you've heard here. Well, I would first point out that I, I too, was there for a portion of the trial in 2003 on Texas redistricting, and apparently Senator Cruz disagrees with the U.S. Supreme Court, which subsequently heard the case after remedial orders were put in place because of what the legislature in part did, which included packing Latino voters into a limited number of districts in order to prevent them from having the opportunity to direct, uh, elect additional Congress members to the Texas delegation. I also just want to point out that I know from personal experience that this is a nonpartisan issue. MALDIF is a nonpartisan organization. The very same decade that we were in Texas litigating against a Republican-led Texas legislature's maps, I was in California in 2001. That's the same decade litigating against a California legislature led by Democrats that had similarly chosen to, in this case, split Latino voters in order to protect incumbents. And by doing that, they prevented Latino community in California from electing another member of their choice to the California congressional delegation. So I know from that experience back then to today, this is not a partisan issue. As you said, this is about enabling every voter to have their opportunity to express their preference and the outcome of the election is then determined by the collective preferences of those in a community. It's about ensuring that we don't have structures, including the way we redistrict, that prevents voters, all eligible voters, from having their views reflected. Much as I would love to talk about Harvard and Yale, uh, I'm going to bring us back to the reason that we're here. Uh, the court in Shelby County made clear that Congress has to show it's done due diligence. That's why we're here, to do the due diligence that the court in Shelby County said we must do for a pre-clearance provision in the voting protection provisions here. Uh, the known practices pre-clearance provision in the House version of the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act identifies seven specific practices that have historically been shown their known practices to diminish the voting rights and power of minority voters. Uh, Mr. Sines, I'd like to ask you to talk about those practices identified in this bill, practices that continue to be used to disenfranchise minority voters. Thank you, Senator. We've talked about some of them already today, but they include, for example, a reversion to at-large seats because of historically recognized by the Supreme Court and going back to the Thornburg versus Jingles decision that at-large seats often play a role in disenfranchising minority voters. They include annexations, de-annexations at the local level because historically those have been used to expand the electorate to include more white voters, to contract the electorate to eliminate more minority areas. Uh, they include redistricting in a context where there has been significant growth of a minority community of any race in a particular jurisdiction. So not all redistricting, but a recognition that where you've had significant growth of the prior decade of a minority community, that's often where you see a failure to create new seats to answer the changes in the electorate. It does include voter ID provisions where 
they are adjudicated either by the Department of Justice or importantly, at the jurisdiction's choice, a district court here in Washington where they conclude that it cannot meet the standard established. It includes a reduction in multilingual voter materials. While Section 203 is a powerful protection for those voters who need non-English language materials, this is to prevent a re retrogression, a reversion in jurisdictions that may look at that as an easy way to lower the minority vote. Uh, it includes those changes in voting locations, precinct changes, polling place relocations that we know often are a barrier to those who have consistently voted over time at a particular place, but it includes those changes where they have a demonstrated disparate impact, discriminatory effect on minority voters. And finally, it includes certain voter purges. Uh, we have seen at Malda problems with voter purges. Just recently, the state of Texas engaged, engaged in a targeted attempt to purge voters based on citizenship information provided years earlier to the Motor Vehicles Department, recognizing that those folks, almost all of them had already naturalized, but had no reason to go back and tell motor vehicles that they had naturalized because it was of no moment or, or significance to that bureau. So those are the practices identified. All of them have a continuing and historical demonstrated effect in being used particularly to reduce the threat perceived by those in power from a growing minority electorate. Historically demonstrated effect based on facts, not Republican facts or Democratic facts. B based on adjudications by and large. And adjudications by judges appointed by the president of both parties and confirmed by the Senate. As Ronald Reagan is said to have remarked, I'm not sure it was originally him, but facts are stubborn things, especially in a courtroom. Uh, let me ask you finally, Mr. Yang, um, could you explain to us why preclearance and practice-based preclearance specifically is so crucial at a time of rapidly increasing diversity in the United States? Uh, the 2020 census results are beginning to show uh, that the United States is diversifying even faster than has been predicted. In particular, Hispanic and Asian Americans are some of the fastest growing demographics. Uh, at the same time, this white non-voter, the non-white voter gap has been drastically increasing in the years immediately following Shelby County. Why is preclearance important? So perhaps jumping off of Mr. Science's testimony and talking about the specific provisions that we're talking about, specific practices that we're talking about. When we're talking, for example, about uh, methods of election, specifically when you're talking about early voting. In all the polls that we have done, Asian Americans prefer early voting, prefer mail-in ballots. If you look at Georgia, for example, 40% of Asian Americans, which is above the, the average in, in Georgia, voted by mail, voted early by mail. 32% voted early by mail in the, the runoff election, whereas only 24% of the general population voted uh, by mail. So that would, be a, that would be a practice that would be of concern. If you're looking at a, a reduction in multilingual voting materials, Asian Americans, approximately one-third, I think it's actually about 30% of Asian Americans, are what would be considered limited English proficient. English is not our first language. Well, we're now no, we are no less of a citizen simply because English is not our first language. The, the notion of disenfranchising voters simply based on language is something that we, we should not be count, count, countenancing. With respect to voter purges, I think uh, Mr. Science has testified about it very well. Again, one of the problems here is notification in language in a culturally appropriate way for the Asian American population, recognizing that a Asian Americans are lower propensity voters. The other thing about all of these practices that we're talking about is essentially we're asking many of these voters, communities of color in particular, to essentially reprove their voter registration or reprove their eligibility to vote, whereas we are not asking that of other people. And here I'm talking about how it is specifically applied. I gave two examples in my uh, initial opening statement about how it's been applied disparately to the Asian American community by asking only Asian Americans about their, uh, about their citizenship or uh, uh, suggesting that Asian Americans should adopt a, a more American sounding name to avoid any problems with respect to voter ID laws. So those are some of the ways in which practice-based preclearance specifically affect our community and which, why it is so important for our community.
Thank you. I'm going to close this hearing. Uh, documents for the record uh, may be submitted. The record will remain open for one week. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Submission of questions uh, or statements. Um, and I'm happy to hear you in a moment, Senator Cruz. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a report entitled Practice-Based Preclearance Prepared by MALDEF, AAJC, and the National Association of Latino Elected Officials Education Fund. Uh, testimony from Dr. Louis Frega and Dr. Bernard Frega, and three reports on voting discrimination prepared by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Hearing no objection, Senator Cruz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to briefly uh, make an observation in response to the exchange between you and Mr. Sines. Mr. Sines made reference to the Texas redistricting case and, and the fact that it went to the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, he is, of course, right. And as he know, knows, I'm the lawyer that argued that case before the U.S. Supreme Court. And Mr. Sines observed the Supreme Court raised concerns about one district. That is true. The Supreme Court also upheld the redistricting map, uh, upheld revoking the Democratic gerrymander that had kept Democrats in power despite the large majority of Texans voting for Republicans consistently. Of the 36 congressional districts, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld 35 of them. There was one district in which the Supreme Court required some modifications. That was CD23. I would note even that district, the only district with which the Supreme Court found any concerns, that district today, CD23, is represented by an Hispanic Republican. Uh, and so the efforts of the Democratic plaintiffs to insist that the Supreme Court somehow ensure that Texans keep sending a large majority of Democrats to Congress, even though the voters disagreed, the Supreme Court thankfully rejected that claim and, and, and followed the law instead as it should have. Uh, this hearing is going to close. I'll invite any of the witnesses who want to respond in writing to any of the comments that have been made. You have an open invitation, a general question. Uh, I apologize that we can't let you do it now because Senator Cruz and I are about to miss a vote. Uh, and uh, I am very, very grateful to every one of you for your very helpful and informative testimony. We are here to do our due diligence. You've aided us very, very significantly. We thank all of you. Thank you. This hearing is adjourned.